Hey, Seraphin here, and today we're gonna bake another sourdough shokupang. But unlike the previous one, this time, we're gonna partially replace the bread flour with whole wheat flour. To be exact, we're gonna swap about 30% of the bread flour for whole wheat flour. What we're aiming for is a healthier shokupang that still tastes absolutely delicious. So here's the ingredients list for the bread we're going to bake. Basically, for most of the ingredients, we still adhere to the guidelines as explained in our previous videos on shokupang bread. But we did make a few adjustments. We raised the overall hydration to quench the thirstier whole wheat flour and added a little more flour to make up for the bread volume loss, the unavoidable consequence of using whole wheat flour. We're going to explain these adjustments along the way, so let's get started making this bread. Okay, we're going to start by making the tangjong. So I'm going to pour in 170 grams of boiling water. It's 169. <laughs> 15 grams of rice flour going straight in and 65 grams of whole wheat flour. Try to make sure the rice flour goes in first and then I'm just going to mix everything together as quickly as I can. All right, this looks pretty much done. It's homogenous and it looks good. I'm just gonna clean off my spatula, clean down the sides just one more time, and we are done. I'm gonna cover it with this cloth and I'm gonna wait for it to come to room temperature before putting it in the fridge overnight. Okay, we've just subjected a big portion of our whole wheat flour and rice flour to heat treatment in the tangchong fashion. We're gonna use it at a later stage after it has rested overnight or longer in the fridge at four degrees Celsius. This process will first gelatinize the starch in the flour and then follow up with the hydrolysis of the gelatinized starch by the endogenous enzymes alpha and beta amylases. This is a very familiar process that we have done a lot of times. So please refer to the many videos I've made on this subject if you need more information. Because we are using whole wheat flour, this process will also indirectly soak the wheat brands in the whole wheat flour. Whole wheat flour incorporation in bread has multiple health benefits, but it also has a detrimental effect on overall bread quality. Notably, the bran in whole wheat flour has been known to cause a decrease in bread loaf volume. In several studies, soaking whole wheat flour and prehydration of the bran before bread making has been shown to improve the bread volume as well as lower crumb firmness. Some researchers suggest that this could be due to the hydrated bran no longer competing with gluten proteins for water, resulting in the bran having less of a negative influence on the gluten network. Soaking also raises the activity of one of the very essential endogenous enzymes of wheat flour, phytase. We're going to talk a little more about this later. For the moment, let's address this question. Does the extra bran in the whole wheat flour have any influence on the starch gelatinization? For context, starch gelatinization is a process that requires excess water, and wheat bran is very capable of binding quite a bit of water. In fact, it has been calculated that wheat bran can bind 1.7 to 3.2 times more water than starch. This is in large part thanks to certain components in the bran, such as arabinoxalans, which have an incredible ability to hold onto water. So on one end, starch gelatinization requires excess water, and on the other end, the wheat bran present in whole wheat flour is extremely capable of holding on to water. Looking at it like this might make you wonder whether or not it's really a good idea to make tangchong with whole wheat flour. Well, to help answer that, we can turn to this paper investigating the impact of wheat bran on wheat starch gelatinization. In the paper, researchers added wheat bran to wheat starch and observed what happened during starch gelatinization. The paper concluded that although wheat bran can bind 1.7 to 3.2 times as much water as starch, substituting starch by bran in a mixture of starch and water is not equivalent to moving into a regime of limiting water. Independently of the moisture content, an increased bran concentration in water increases the onset temperature and peak temperature. On the contrary, wheat bran did not have an impact on conclusion temperature as the end of gelatinization was only determined by the moisture content of the mixture. The effect of wheat bran was therefore limited to an effect on the onset temperature and peak temperature. So there is no doubt that our tangchong will be all right. 
Now let's move on to prepare our levain. Okay, so to make the levain, we have here a mature sourdough starter at its peak. We've also got 60 grams of water and 60 grams of whole wheat flour. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take the lid off this starter, look at those bubbles, and I'm gonna mix everything together. And here, since I already have 60 grams of water, I'm just gonna immediately add in 30 grams of sourdough starter. Three more grams, perfect, 30. And we're going to add in our whole wheat flour. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to move the scale aside and I'm going to mix everything together with chopsticks. Really perfect for this. Okay, once everything's mixed together, we're done. I'm just gonna clean off my chopsticks. Now I'm gonna put a rubber band to mark the position of this levain so that we can see when it rises. It's about here, okay. And then I'm just gonna cover it and we're gonna leave it for about one to two hours outside, letting it rise a little bit before putting it in the fridge overnight with the cool tangchong. Usually we make levain to serve two purposes. One, to scale up our sourdough starter so as to give our dough that much needed large number of microorganisms and hence the gassing power to leaven it. Two, to change the flavor profile of our sourdough starter. My sourdough starter is a typical traditional sourdough starter that is regularly refreshed with bread flour and water. For most of the levain I've made before, I've always used the same type of bread flour and water as the new nutrients. This time though, we're going to use whole wheat flour. Now, if you compare the nutritional contents of whole wheat flour and unenriched white flour, you will observe a large jump in the number of fiber and micronutrients, such as minerals and vitamins. Micronutrients are essential ingredients that we need in very small amounts. However, the impacts of these ingredients on our body's health are critical and deficiency in any of them can cause severe and even life-threatening conditions. Whole wheat flour is considered to be healthier partly due to its high mineral content. Most of the minerals of the wheat grains are located in their outer layers, namely in the bran, the aleurone layer, and the germ, most of which are removed during the processing of refined flour, like in bread flour. While there are substantially more minerals in the whole wheat flour, the majority of these minerals, though, are unavailable to us because they are bound in a phytate complex, hence their actual bioavailability to us is at its best minimal. Phytate is the salt form of phytic acid. It is the primary storage compound of phosphorus in bran and seeds, and hence whole wheat flour. As we know, next to calcium, phosphorus is the most abundant mineral in the body. These two important nutrients work closely together to build strong bones and teeth. About 85% of the body's phosphorus is in its bones and teeth. Phosphorus is also present in smaller amounts in cells and tissues throughout the body. Besides grains, phosphorus is also found in milk and other proteins rich foods. Phosphorus, though, is not of our concern here. Most of us get plenty of phosphorus in our diets. Our main interest is the phytic acid. Phytic acid is an anti-nutrient that impairs absorption of several minerals, like zinc, iron, and calcium, into the body. It does this by binding to minerals, making those minerals inaccessible to us. More technically speaking, phytic acid tends to chelate metallic cations, forming insoluble compounds that reduce the bioavailability of these minerals. This is mainly because we don't have much of a specific enzyme called phytase that is required to break phytic acid down. So when we eat foods with high phytic acid content, it binds the minerals that it comes into contact with. We can only wave them goodbye as they pass through our system. 
At this point, phytic acid sounds terrible, but actually it's not entirely a bad thing. It's not black and white because while phytic acid does impair the absorption of minerals, phytic acid can also serve as an antioxidant and might even protect against insulin resistance. In conclusion, whether phytic acid is a good thing or not depends a lot on who is consuming it. People with certain mineral deficiencies such as iron deficiency would probably be better off avoiding it in some meals. But for healthy people with well-balanced diets, it's not something you need to avoid, especially considering that many foods containing phytic acid are incredibly nutritious. Of course, there are many ways to get rid of or reduce phytic acid in our foods. Milling is one, hence how we get refined white flour, bread flour, all-purpose flour, and cake flour. These flours do not have that much phytic acid, but they also have greatly reduced amounts of minerals and fibers. When it comes to whole wheat flour, nothing is removed from the flour since the whole grain is used. So a popular method of reducing phytic acid content is by soaking the flour, preferably for a long period of time. This is one of the reasons we made the whole wheat flour into tangzhong before. This works to reduce the phytic acid by allowing the endogenous phytase to break it down. Aside from soaking, fermentation is another great way to lower phytic acid content. Even regular baker's yeast can reduce the amount of phytic acid content within flour greatly. But sour does an even better job thanks to the acidic conditions it provides. You see, phytases here work optimally in acidic conditions. The pH optimum of wheat phytase is pH 5. Just by making the dough a little more acidic, the phytases can demolish a sizable percentage of phytates. This is coupled with the fact that phytates are more soluble at lower pHs. In one study, a slight acidification of the dough to pH 5.5 showed a whopping 70% breakdown of the initial phytate content. The researchers also highlighted that the main player in the phytate breakdown were the flour's endogenous phytase enzymes. Lactic acid bacteria do not participate directly in phytate degradation, but provide favorable conditions for the endogenous cereal phytase activity by lowering the pH value. For this recipe, there is another good reason we made our tangzhong and levain with whole wheat flour. As these two derivative ingredients are prepared in advance, overnight or a day before, we minimize the detrimental effects on phytate hydrolysis due to the addition of milk into the dough, because milk-derived calcium has been shown to seriously inhibit phytate hydrolysis. Okay, now that the levain and the tangchung are done, we can get to work on our final dough. So I've got my mise en place already in place. In my stand mixer's bowl, I'm just going to add in the tangchung. And then the levain. And then 80 grams of whole milk, 25 grams of sugar, 7.5 grams of salt, 0.5 grams of instant yeast. This is optional. You can leave it out for a sourdough only fermentation, but I like to add it to make sure it's nice and predictable. And it's also going to take much longer if you're using sourdough alone. Okay, finally, 260 grams of bread flour. And we still have one more ingredient, which is 30 grams of butter, but I'm going to mix this with my spatula for a bit first before running it through the mixer for about three minutes at a medium speed. And then we're gonna add the butter and knead it until it reaches full gluten development, which should take about 10 to 12 more minutes after that. So I'm going to give this a little mix first. Let's go to the mixer.
Okay, now that the dough is done and it's already passed the window pane test, we can continue on to the next step, which is really just leaving it to bulk ferment. I've got a glass bowl and some oil here. I'm gonna put a little bit of it into the bowl as well as put a bit on my hands. We're gonna line the bowl. And I'm gonna grab my scraper and clean down the sides of the bowl. I'm gonna scoop it out. If you have enough oil on your hands, it shouldn't be sticking at any point. And we're now just gonna quickly round this. Drop it into the bowl. And we're gonna cover it and leave it to ferment to rise until it doubles in size, which should take about an hour to an hour and a half. It's quite predictable if you're using instant yeast. All right. If you're not using instant yeast, if you're using sourdough, then it may vary pretty greatly. So make sure to keep an eye on your dough and especially your room temperature. While the dough is fermenting, we should take a minute just to appreciate what the sourdough does in our dough. It's pretty well known that sourdough bread is probably healthier for you than bread fermented with baker's yeast alone. For one thing, the use of sourdough has been shown to lower the glycemic index of the bread. And in case you aren't aware, the glycemic index of a food is how quickly it raises your blood sugar levels. Generally speaking, lower glycemic index foods seem to be better for your health. Sourdough can lower the glycemic index of breads greatly, especially when paired with dietary fiber. But there is a catch with this. Just because sourdough fermentation can lower the GI of breads doesn't mean that all sourdough breads have a low glycemic index. One of the biggest caveats being that if the bread doesn't have a pretty low pH, then it's probably not a low GI sourdough bread. In fact, one of the main suggested factors behind why sourdough lowers the GI of bread is because of the accumulation of organic acids especially lactic acid. So roughly speaking, a relatively easy way to lower your sourdough bread's GI is to just prolong fermentation and let the dough get more and more sour. But it's not quite that simple. Changes in the dough pH can trigger a lot of side effects. And by lowering the dough pH, one of these side effects is increased proteolysis or protein breakdown by protease enzymes. Given that gluten, our dough's main source of strength is a protein, this is a pretty important factor in sourdough bread making. To a certain extent, proteolysis can improve the bread by making it more flavorful as well as more voluminous. But beyond that point, proteolysis will literally break your dough down into a liquid like slurry. So with extending the fermentation time, it's really a balance between accumulating all those beneficial parts of sourdough fermentation and still having a good bread dough. By saying beneficial parts, I mean more than just lowering the glycemic index of the bread. We've already seen how sourdough fermentation increases the bioavailability of minerals in whole wheat by reducing phytic acid. And the thing is that sourdough fermentation has been shown to be capable of degrading a whole range of other anti-nutrients. Sourdough fermentation has also been shown to promote the formation of resistant starch, and sourdough bread may help promote healthy gut microbiota. The microbes in sourdough also produce things that make the bread taste better and last longer, such as exopolysaccharides that benefit the texture and shell life of the bread. Sourdough also improves bread by optimizing conditions for the activity of cereal arabinoxylinases that solubilize water-insoluble arabinoxylins during sourdough fermentation. Although arabinoxylin sounds like an unfamiliar term, this is actually just a kind of dietary fiber. In fact, arabinoxylins make up the majority of dietary fiber in whole wheat bread. Arabinoxylins are divided into two categories, water extractable and water unextractable. The water extractable type is the one we like because it can improve our bread by stabilizing protein forms against thermal denaturation, gel formation under acidic conditions, and other factors including binding water up to 15 to 
20 times their weight. On the other hand, water unextractable arabinoxalan is detrimental to our bread. It interferes with the gluten network and destabilizes gas bubbles. So by optimizing the activity of an enzyme that solubilizes water unextractable arabinoxalans, we can expect a better dough hydration, increased bread volume, and crumb elasticity. All right, it's been an hour and a half. The dough has roughly doubled in size. Now we're gonna divide and pre-shape it. First things first, I'm just going to sprinkle a bit of flour on the top and just degas it, punching it down. You can see these beautiful bubbles. I'm just gonna scoop it out, drop it onto the surface. And now I'm gonna weigh the whole thing first. 790 grams, divide that by two, 390. Okay, I'm gonna divide that into two. Cut straight away, 10 grams off, two grams off. All right, and now we're gonna pre-shape them. So quick and simple. Folding in the edges, and then we'll round that out. You shouldn't need to use too much flour at this stage. And you also don't want to pre-shape it too tightly. We're just making sure it looks nice and even with a pretty smooth surface on top. Okay. I'm just gonna cover them and let them rest for about 15 minutes as a bench rest. All right, in the meantime, I'm just going to align my loaf pan with some nonstick coating. We want to make sure to line all the sides, especially these corners. Okay. The shokupang tends to stick on the sides, so make sure you get them really well coated. May even add a bit more nonstick coating after I put in the dough, just in case my hand brushed them or anything. We're also going to get the top because we're going to be making a nice rectangular shokubo. Okay. And we're good with that. I'm just going to set this aside and we just have to wait for the dough to finish relaxing. All right, it's been 15 minutes, so I'm just gonna take the cover off and we're gonna start shaping these dough balls. Using a bit of flour, I'm just gonna move this one out of the way and we're gonna start working on this one. So I'm gonna flip it over so the smooth side is on the bottom. I'm gonna spread it out just a little bit, patting it down, and then I'm gonna roll it out. And the goal is to get into basically a long rectangular shape. You may have to use a bit more flour here for being a bit more intensive. And the sourdough has already started to work. Okay, make sure to degas that. Use a scraper just to tidy things up does not need to be too long. This is good enough. One last roll. And then we're gonna be folding in the sides. Starting with the right side and then moving on to the left. Okay. Gonna roll it out. One more time. And this is really just to degas it and make sure it's even. Okay, sides should be nice and neat. Okay. And now I'm just gonna start rolling it up. You wanna go slow and steady, but make sure that it's nice and neat. And we scoop it up. 
I'm going to pinch to seal. And we are pretty much done. Okay. Giving it a bit of flour to make sure it doesn't stick to anything. And we move on to the next dough ball. All right, now that they're both rolled up, I'm just going to arrange them so that these swirls are in opposing directions. And that's how I'm gonna put it into the loaf pan. Okay, so this one's this way, this way. I think I need to flip this one. All right. And to the loaf pan they go. I'm gonna try to do this without brushing the sides. And now finally, I'm just going to press them down with my knuckles, really just to get them settled in. This is also your last chance to adjust their positions. So if anything looks off, then this is how you adjust it. All right, I'm going to cover them and now we're gonna leave them to proof for about one hour to an hour and a half, roughly the same timing as before, or until the dough rises to about three to four centimeters below the edge of this pan. Of course, this timing is for our hybrid usage of instant yeast and sourdough. If you're using sourdough alone, then it's gonna take a lot longer. So be prepared. Okay, so the dough is fully done with its proofing and I've already preheated the oven to 190 degrees Celsius. Now we're gonna bake it at 190 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes on top and bottom heat before turning it to bottom heat only and baking it for 20 minutes. Every oven is different, so make sure to adjust this timing to your own oven. And it's done. And that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and bye.